Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in 1 John chapter 4. We resume our study in verse 5. We're going through the New Testament this series, and we're in the home stretch of that New Testament study. But we're in 1 John chapter 4, verse 5, so you can get your Bible, open it up to 1 John chapter 4. You can study the Word of God with me anytime you want to at the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And not only can you study anytime you want to, you can study whatever part of the Bible you want to at any time. There are three, almost four complete series going through the entire Bible. And you can choose the series, choose the book of the Bible, choose the chapter, click and listen. All you have to do is bring your Bible, the Word of God, from Genesis through Revelation. If you haven't begun a verse-by-verse study with me through the whole Bible, that's something that I would encourage you to do. <clears throat> the whole counsel of God is important, all 66 books, and that's why I teach it, and I have been for over 33 years. So it would be good for you to study. I really believe it. Or why would God have given it to us, right? Anyway, that's at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth, your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, let's begin reading in verse 2. We studied 2 through 4, so I'm not going to comment on it. I'll just read it, and we begin in verse 5. By this, we, by this know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, of which ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Now, the they and the them in verse 5, refer, refer to the Antichrists with a S, the Antichrists. And John has just said there's a lot of them in the world. And it's basically talking about false teachers who misrepresent Jesus and misrepresent the Word of God. Look at 5 again. They are of the world, the Antichrists, the false teachers. Therefore, they... Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The masses of the world do not love truth. They never have, they never will. The majority of people love sin. And the thought of them going to hell and paying for their sins is something they scoff at, or something they don't think about, or something that they just when, when they do think about it, they readjust their thinking and put it out of their mind and replace it with some sin. They love what is false. The majority of the people in the world want to be told that if there is a God, they are fine with him. Everything's good. You don't need to be holy. You don't need to repent. You don't need to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. That's what most people want to believe. And that is what most people do believe. You know, Jesus, for a while, was very popular because of his miracles. But at the same time, he was hated because of his message. Consequently, the preacher whose messages are popular with the unsaved world is not saying what God wants him to say. <clears throat> because when Jesus spoke the word of God, he was not popular with the world. 
and neither will we be today. The one who preaches the word of God and doesn't water it down is, will be popular and is popular with a remnant of faithful people who want to follow Jesus and sincerely want truth, but he will not be popular with the masses. Five and six. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. By this know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the we and the us refer to the apostles. The they, in verse 5, referred to the Antichrist. The we and the us refers to the apostles. A true Christian will listen to the apostles' teaching, and that teaching is found in the New Testament of the Bible. A true Christian will listen to the apostles' teaching found in the New Testament of the Bible. True Christians want the truth. Saved people want the truth. They want truth that makes them comfortable, that blesses them, that encourages them. They also want truth that makes them uncomfortable if they're doing something wrong. That's what they want. I don't worry about offending the people that I speak to because I know the vast, vast majority of people who listen to me love the truth and they expect to be blessed and they expect to be encouraged and they expect to be made uncomfortable and they want all those things. It's all, it's all a package deal, you know. It all goes together when the word of God is proclaimed clearly. And I say again, true Christians want the truth that makes them comfortable and uncomfortable. They don't care as long as it is truth, as long as it is God's word. Those professing Christians who only want to hear Christian pep, pep talks from their motivational speakers disguised as pastors better double check their salvation because they are likely playing a deadly game with their immortal soul. Those who become stiff as a ramrod when they get something from Scripture that doesn't set well with them have a big spiritual problem. Red flags should go up in their soul. And there are little indicators Okay, some people can come across looking like they're Christians, and maybe they are, but there are little indicators. Let me give you one example. Oh, this is probably about 25 years ago. I knew a Christian, and I thought she was saved. She acted like the love, the, the Word of God blessed her. She seemed to enjoy the word of God when it was taught. But she tolerated certain things in her life that were sinful that would give a person pause as to whether she was a Christian or not. But there was a lot about her where she acted like a Christian, you know, and I'll never forget, she listened to a message by some other preacher, and she was all upset because this preacher said something that upset her. And, I, and she asked me about it. I said, it's in the Bible. It's clear as crystal. It's in the Bible. Well, I know it's in the Bible, but he still shouldn't teach it. That was troublesome. And now I had no contact with her for years. 
And recently I had, and uh, there is no mention of God or Jesus or the word of God in her life at all. See, there were indicators that were troubling. And it eventually, evidently has shown itself in no faith in God, no faith in the word of God, no love for Jesus, not a part of her life. See, just not normal for a real Christian to reject the word of God when it is clearly taught in the word of God. A true Christian will have a heart for God, period. And his word, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. A true Christian will have a heart for God and anything else that is God-like. How do you know if you've been born of God? Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. That's not to say that our love will be as perfect and as consistent as God's love, because it won't be, but we'll want to be like him, and we will be like him, at least to some degree, and we'll feel bad when we are not. Notice verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. That means, that means real love is like God. Don't miss that. Because there's a lot of people who don't understand what real love is. They think it's feelings. They think it's a physical attraction. They think it's just a matter of getting along with someone or enjoying someone's company and having fun with someone. Those things all may be present in a loving relationship, and hopefully they are. But, but keep in mind what verse 8 says. God is love. That means real love is like God. If God is love, then real love, genuine love, is like God. Real love is kind, therefore. Real love is unselfish. Real love is patient. Real love is holy. Real love is righteous like God. Real love exists within the boundaries of the written word of God like God. True love only exists within the boundaries of God's character. True love, therefore, only exists within the boundaries of the word of God. So this woman that I spoke of wanted that preacher who was faithfully teaching God's word, who she accused of being unloving and hurtful, even though what he was teaching was in the word of God, she wanted him to be loving according to her definition of love, which was withhold truth that makes people feel uncomfortable, rather than being what he was, which was loving, forgiving the truth, even though it did make her uncomfortable. It is not loving to withhold truth. It is not loving to teach something other than what Scripture teaches. It is not loving to break the commandments in order to make someone feel good. Nine. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Those who say that God doesn't love them because something bad happened to them or to someone that they cared about, or because he doesn't give them something that they prayed for. Those who say that God doesn't love them for those types of reasons fail to appreciate how much love it took for God the Father to allow his son to come and live on this planet and be hated and mistreated and spit upon and beaten and whipped nearly to death. They don't appreciate how much love it took for God the Father to allow his son to be nailed to a cross and die for our sins. 
to say, how dare you say that God is unloving because he won't give you something or because something bad happened to you or something bad happened to somebody that you care about. How dare you say that God is not loving after all that he went through in allowing his son to go through that hell. Especially you should know better if you have children. The one time, the angriest I've ever been in my entire life, and I'll never forget it, was when my son was mistreated <clears throat> by an adult. And he was a young man, very young man, but he was mistreated, he was treated unfairly, and I was furious. I never got that angry when I was mistreated. No. That was the angriest I've ever been when my son was mistreated. And that was nothing compared to what the father witnessed when his son was mistreated. Mistreated? That's an understatement. Don't ever say that God is unloving. I don't care what you have to go without. I don't care what you don't like about this life. God has already proven his love. He doesn't have to do another thing. We should never question God's love for us. Look to the cross. Think about the cross and Jesus on it, and it will remind you just how much God loves you. Verse 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. God was not responding to our great love for him when he allowed his son to be crucified for our sins. Jesus, the eternal son of the eternal father, was not responding to our great love for him, our creator, when he allowed himself to be crucified for our sins. He wasn't responding to our love for him. God did not say, you know, the people love me so much. Everybody on earth, most people on earth, you know, they love me so much. I just have to love them back. They've been so good to me that I just have to repay their kindness. No. Jesus died for us. He loved us even though our sin was offensive to him beyond what we can imagine. 10 again, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means the death of Jesus Christ satisfied the demands of the broken law of God, which we are all guilty of doing. Propitiation means that the death of Jesus Christ satisfied the demands of the broken law of God. Jesus' blood, his shed blood in his death was the payment, the punishment for our sins. His death satisfied the holy justice of God, which had to be satisfied. Because when the Bible says that God is love, that's true, but that's only one of his attributes. Another one of his attributes, he is omnipresence. He's everywhere at the same time. He's all powerful. He never changes. These are all attributes of God. And so is the fact that God is just. It's another part of his character. And the Bible says he cannot deny himself. So sin had to be paid for. Jesus did it. He was the only one who could. 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Since God, who is holy, so graciously loved us, who are unholy, we sure should love our fellow man. And again, 
It's not talking about feelings. It's not talking about having warm feelings. You shouldn't have warm feelings toward no account sinners, whether they call themselves Christians or not. It's not talking about that kind of love. God loved us. How? By having warm feelings toward us? No. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He did what was in our best interest, spiritually speaking, even though he sacrificed himself to do it. That, in a nutshell, is the love that God wants us to have for all people. It has nothing to do with feelings. It means to do and say what is in the best interest, spiritually speaking, of other people, always within the boundaries of Scripture. Say, yeah, but I know some people that don't deserve it. Well, I know someone that doesn't deserve it either, me. God loves us even though we don't deserve it. Not a one of us. Well, I might not deserve it, but I deserve it more than that character who lives next door to me. No, no one deserves it, period. If you were grading on a curve, maybe you could say that. If God was grading on a curve, maybe you could say, but he doesn't grade on a curve. His standard of judgment is right and wrong. Holiness and sin. It's all or nothing. God loves us even though we don't deserve it, so we should love others even though they don't deserve it. Deserving has nothing in the world to do with it. You do what is in the best interest of others, spiritually speaking, long term. Now, sometimes that means you've got to do something that they don't like. Sometimes that you've got to do something that makes them feel bad. Sometimes that means that you can't hang out with them anymore. You, you can't be around them anymore. And may, they may not like that. Because sometimes it takes something like that to wake somebody up spiritually. Verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. No one can see God with physical eyes today. However, when Christians love, they manifest the presence of God through their actions. So, people see God in Christians to the degree that those Christians allow God to live and love and live the word through them. People see God today in Christians who allow God to control their words and their actions. As we live like Jesus, people catch a glimpse of Jesus in us, and then they will either be drawn to him or repelled from him, depending on our attitude. See, it's not our business as Christians to win popularity contests. It's not the job of a pastor to become Mr. Popular, Mr. Rockstar Pastor, Mr. Popular. It's all messed up. Those people who do that are totally messed up, trying to get the world to like them, to think they're cool. That's not the job of a Christian. It is certainly not the job of a pastor. Our job as Christians, no matter what our calling in life may be, is to let Jesus live through us, Jesus speak through us, through the written word of God. And then those who have a heart for God will be drawn to us, will want to be around us. I'll warn you ahead of time, as Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Don't expect a crowd. Most people will reject you. Most people will be repelled from you because... The love, the things that the world loves are contrary to God. Our job 
is to live like Jesus. My job as a teacher of God's word is to teach it clearly, very clearly, without watering it down. And as we do that, and as I do that, people will either be drawn to us, to me, or repelled. Doesn't have anything to do with me. As long as I'm teaching the word of God and living like Jesus, doesn't have anything to do with you as long as you're living like Jesus and speaking the truth and love. Everything depends on other people's attitude toward God. They either be drawn or repelled, depending on their attitude. We, we have our job to do. And we have to do that regardless of the results. Leave the results to God. You obey God. You, it's like Jesus said to Peter when he said, how long is John, I'm paraphrasing, how long is John going to live? How is he going to die? Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, that's none of your business. You follow me. That's our business. We are to follow Jesus. Let others do what they will do. Verse 13. By this know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. The Holy Spirit in Christians is, is their connection to God. He is a connection that causes a Christian to want to know him better, to have a hunger to know God better, to have a hunger to know Jesus better. The Holy Spirit gives us a hunger for God and a hunger for the Word of God and a hunger for holiness. The Holy Spirit is our connection to God, the Holy Spirit in us. If, if there's no hunger for God, if there's no hunger for Jesus, if there's no desire for the word of God, if there's no desire to be holy, then there's absolutely no indication that the Holy Spirit is in you. Everything points to the fact that he isn't. And then you don't have that connection to God. And the Bible says, if anybody does not have the spirit of God, he does not belong to God. See how it all fits together? I'm telling you the truth, folks. Right, square, right straight from the word of God. 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. John and the other apostles seen. Boy, they saw a lot for those three plus years. John and the other apostles lived with Jesus for over three years. They observed Jesus during good times and bad. They heard him teach. They listened to him talk. And every time his lips moved, he spoke the word of God. They saw him love the unlovable. They saw him do more miracles than, be, than could be counted. They saw, him, they saw him raise at least three people from the dead. They saw him dying for our sins. They saw him after he was raised from the dead in his physical body. They saw him eat broiled fish and honey after he was raised. No wonder the entire group of apostles was willing to die for the truth that Jesus was the resurrected Savior, the only way to heaven. No wonder they were willing to die for that. I got to stop. You can continue studying with me, as I mentioned earlier, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study as long as you want. Fill yourself with the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination. For 33 years, I've been doing Scripture Verse by Verse, and... I've never been underwritten, as I have said in the past, by a large church or denomination. It's been a faith ministry all these years. I just teach the Word of God. Like I said earlier, I do what God wants me to do. I say what He wants me to say. I stick to the Word. And I trust that He will raise up people who love His Word to support and pray for me. So click the Donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. See you next.